Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the UBC Learning Circle. Together with MOVE UBC, UBC Recreation, and UBC Wellbeing, we are pleased to be joining joined in circle today by Chief Laura Muscle Savage, Elder Alec Nelson, Dr. Rosalind Miles, Winique Horn Miller, Lyric Atchison, and we'll also be visited by past athlete Deborah Sparrow today. Um, and uh, through all of these, you know, gathered uh, knowledge keepers, elders, and fantastic individuals, we're going to be breaking into the topic of decolonizing physical activity in sport. I'd like to take a moment here um, and recognize one of our partners for this event, the UBC School of Kinesiology. Uh, kinesiology is a long-standing contributing partner and valued stakeholder in MOVE UBC month and is an organizational partner for the panel. This panel would not have been made possible without the school's contribution and 2021 marks their 75th anniversary. So I hope you all join me in wishing the school a very happy 75th. Before I get into anything else, I would like to acknowledge that I'm zooming in from the traditional ancestral unceded and occupied territories of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people. I would also like to acknowledge the First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the UBC Learning Circle and allowing us to do what we do. Uh, so gentle reminder here, uh, the topics we cover can sometimes be sensitive or emotionally triggering. Um, if that's you for today, please make sure that you're looking after yourself. If at any point you feel that you need to talk to a friend, elder, counselor, family member, you know, whatever that support system looks like for you, I encourage you to access it. Uh, so brief introductions. Uh, my name is Cole. I'm from the Chowethel First Nation. I'm going to be hanging out today with you, uh, sharing the digital space, but off camera are Cynthia, our production coordinator, um, Yasmin and Elisa from uh, from UBC Rec, and, um, and Winona, our uh, Learning Circle program assistant. And if you feel so inclined, please introduce yourself in the chat box to kind of get that dialogue started. Uh, so without further ado, look at that, like a minute and a half. I'm going to pass it over to, to Chief Laura Muscle Savage, please. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we would like to begin by introducing our elders, and we have Elder Gail Sparrow coming up first for a proper opening. Yeah, thank you so much for asking uh, us to step forward the traditional lands and ancient territories of the Musqueam people. And on behalf of my chief, Wayne Sparrow, and our council members, but mostly on behalf of our past athletes, our ancestors, um, the ones we have never lost touch with through our spirit of understanding of what it is to be Musqueam, what it is to be First Nation, what it is to be uh, involved with the amazing abilities that our ancestors had and we have of staying connected. So this word decolonizing, which is fairly new for everyone, is uh, for me interesting because I, I don't think we ever felt that we actually ever lost touch with our sport. In fact, as a child growing up in this time of year, uh, I would be down at the river with my father and different family members as they trained for canoe racing. Uh, the same time as the Oligans came. And so everything that we did, of course, in our circle of life uh, related to our physical health. And, you know, it's really important that our youth um, have begun to embrace again how just really valuable uh, sport is and means to our, our communities as First Nations people. Yeah, so this time of year is an important time for a lot of communities when the spring comes and we're preparing ourselves for what's to come and what was. So in leaving that part of my life behind as a competitive athlete, I often wondered what would replace it. And uh, I really dove into the historical and the connection of our people. Hence, you see my work in the background. And so I realized that they were one and the same and that I had to know as much as I could about our history and connect that to the focus and the discipline that our people had and so I came up with this beautiful statement that says it's the academics of art or you know sport as a challenge just like art is in making sure that you know you're focused and you're going towards something not necessarily always just physical or mental but definitely the spiritual so I believe for our people that that has always been there. And I know that a lot of you out there 
who have been involved with sport over the years um, understand that. And I'm really excited to see where we can go from here and embrace all of our youth and carry them with us and have them carry our people forward in showing and waiting for our athletes to rise to the level that I know they can and that we're here to support them. And so in any way that I can help, I certainly want to and I encourage all of my children and grandchildren to not be better than anybody, but to be the best that they can be. And in carrying that, you do really sort of end in, as I mentioned earlier, not just the physical, the mental, but the spiritual connection that makes us as First Nations have a feeling of uniqueness as we're running and training. And as we walk through COVID, um, I found I would walk every night to my river and I found that during this time we had more and more of our Musqueam people out walking than I'd ever seen. So I got to visit people again like I did when I was a child and people used to walk and walk and visit at the same time. So, you know, for all the things that happen negative, there's positive that comes from it as well. So I'm looking forward to our future in sport and just to see where we can go with it. So I'd like to wish you all the best and good words, um, not only from here, but from here. So on behalf of my people, thank you. And thank you, that was Deborah Sparrow from Musqueam First Nation. Thank you for that opening. I'd like to ask our elder Alec Nelson to help us as well with some words of um, blessing and opening for this session. Alec? Uh, um, acknowledging our, our wonderful chief. Um, I've acknowledged the Musqueam nation for their kind and wonderful um, welcome and invitation to come to their lands and um, and for their to their sacred territory territory. As soon as I saw the picture of our sister Debbie, I felt at home already. Debbie Sparrow, she was the spokesperson there. And um, I guess in saying that, I, I also want to acknowledge um, the territories that each of you um, that are online, um, where you stand. And um, so that's across the nations. And um, it's awesome that acknowledgements um, always are so appropriate. I thank the creator for this moment. Thank you, creator, for our families, our loved ones, and um, ask the creator to be with those that are in special need of prayer at this point and uh, recognizing what's happening around the world but at the same time in our homes, our communities. Um, I guess I wanted to also acknowledge UBC for opening up your big house for us to come and gather. And uh, it really stimulated my mind to make a political statement at this point. We know that Canada um, has a constitution and in a corner of a constitution, there's a box called the Indian Act. And therein lies the separation of a people of Canadians as opposed to Indian. And in there, it starts to guide us to two systems, what we call a parallel system. And I know as a model, I've used the double helix as one of those examples of trying to illustrate what this means. And uh, so I guess, um, you know, the characteristics, the individualities of these two strands that are called um, the helix uh, really defines in my mind, my heart, what Canada is, you know. Um, but at the same time, I also really appreciate the notion that we are all on the same boat. We're tied side by side and we may be different in different ways. But there again, I think the themes that are, are being encouraged uh, with this uh, panel and throughout this afternoon um, is going to give us a better understanding historically of what happened and what, what's happening now, what's going to, what are we looking for for tomorrow? And so with that, uh, thank you, Chief, for the opportunity to offer these words. And to all the panelists, I'm so, um, I, I admire these young spirits that are going to be speaking to you. Thank you for your kind hearts. Wait, thank you.
Thank you, Elder Alec. I appreciate that very much. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment here to introduce uh, the moderator for the converse, uh, for the, the discussion that we're going to have in greater detail. So Chief Laura Muscle Savage uh, has a Bachelor of Kinesiology. She was raised both in Chilliwack and in the urban setting of Vancouver. Um, she's proud of her Squaw First Nation ancestry and is a dedicated athlete. Uh, Laura focuses her passion for sport on Indigenous sport and youth. She graduated as a Westbrook Scholar from UBC with a BKIN in sport management. In 2005, Laura was awarded Canada's National Tom Longboat Award for Female Indigenous Athlete of the Year and has competed in four world championships in the sport of ultimate, winning two gold and two bronze medals. Laura's career in sport has included management roles with UBC's Department of Athletics and Recreation, Air Canada PGA Tour Championship, and BC Sports Hall of Fame and Museum. Laura was the project manager, Aboriginal sport and youth for the Vancouver Organizing Committee, Committee for the 2010 Olympics and Paralympic Winter Games. Laura currently serves as the director of sport with ISPAR, uh, and she was inducted into the Chilliwack Sports Hall of Fame in 2016 for her achievements in and con contribution to sport. She is an ambassador for the hashtag level the field campaign that promotes gender equity in sport and is also a trustee for the BC Sports Hall of Fame and Museum. Since 2014, Laura has served as an elected counselor for her nation and was elected as chief counselor in 2020. She, re she resides in Chilliwack on the Squaw Reserve with her husband and two children. Um, and I'm just gonna take a moment because after this, I, I won't be saying a whole lot um, just to express how, how humbled I am to be sharing space with so many of you. Uh, wonderfully accomplished people and athletes and, and advocates for your community as well as Indigenous people on the whole. So without further ado, Chief Laura, Laura Muscle Savage, please take it away. Really excited. Thank you, Cole. Um, thank you for the, the introduction. It is a real honor. I too am humbled with this amazing panel that we have here today to speak to everyone about this really important topic of decolonizing sport and physical activity. I'd like to um, acknowledge I'm coming to you today from the Squaw First Nation. Uh, we're members of the Palalt tribes out in Chilliwack in the Fraser Valley in southern British Columbia. Um, also like to acknowledge MOVE UBC, the School of Kinesiology, the UBC Learning Circle, UBC Recreation, the UBC Wellbeing for bringing this panel discussion to all of you today. Um, I'd like to do, take a moment to introduce our amazing set of panelists. So I'm going to go one by one to introduce um, our panel members and then just ask you to please give us a hello, let us know where you're coming from today and maybe share one or two words uh, that represent how you're feeling um, coming into today's discussion. So I'm going to begin with Elder Alec Nelson. Alec is a proud member of the Muskoma Zadunayuk First Nation in Kinkum Inlet, BC. He's currently an elder and senior advisor to the Indigenous Sport, Physical Activity and Recreation Council, also known as ISPARC. Alex has been a prominent leader in Indigenous sport in BC and in Canada. He's one of the founders of the Aboriginal Sports and Recreation Association of BC, which later evolved into ISPARC. He is a founder of the Aboriginal Sports Circle, the National Body for Indigenous Sport in Canada, and was the first chairperson and three-time president of the North American Indigenous Games Council. One of Alec's proudest moments was when he directed the delivery of the 1997 North American Indigenous Games, otherwise known as NAG in Victoria, as well as coaching the 16U Team BC boys to a gold medal at the 2017 NAG. Alec was recently inducted into the Victoria Sports Hall of Fame, as well as the BC Sports Hall of Fame with its most prestigious and highest honor of the WAC Bennett Award. Alec holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Leisure Studies from UVic, so he's a UVic alum. He and his lovely wife Nella have resided in Victoria for nearly 50 years. Alec, it is an honor to have you with us today. Welcome to you and hello. Next, we have Dr. Rosalind Miles. Dr. Rosalind Miles is from Itlahachmuch, if I hope I've gotten that one right, um, nation and active community member, Lytton First Nation. Rosen completed her education and doctoral degree curriculum and instruction, majoring in exercise science and a graduate certificate in nonprofit management at the University of Central Florida. 
She obtained her master's degree in human kinetics, specialized in coaching science at UBC. Rosalyn is also an active kinesiologist and a certified strength and conditioning specialist in National Strength and Con Conditioning Association. For the past several years, Rosalind has been serving as a research associate in Indigenous Studies and Kinesiology program at UBC. Her research and training are focused on the promotion of Indigenous health and wellness and understanding the value of traditional, cultural, and historical knowledge from diverse communities from a strength-based approach. In 2019, Rosalind received the House of Commons Vancouver Quadra's Hidden Hero Award for her work as the founder and executive director of the Indigenous Physical Activity and Cultural Circle, which is a national nonprofit organization hosting annual 5K runs with the Musqueam community to promote physical activity and well being. Rosalind has led the hosting of seven National Indigenous Physical Activity and Wellness Conferences and will be hosting the first national con conference virtually this coming May. Overall, Dr. Miles has a combined 36 years of experience working in the sports, fitness, education, and health field in a variety of disciplines as a Division I level NCAA coach, active release therapist, college and university instructor, research writer, national awarded coach, and a national level athlete. Welcome to you, Dr. Rosalind Miles. Where are you joining us from? And would you like to share a couple of words of how you're feeling? Well, I'm excited. Um, I'm actually claimed from the traditional unceded territory of the Musqueam people. So I'm here to be here um, in our community. And I, I look forward to hearing everyone else's presentations as well. Thank you, Cook Shem. Thanks, Rosalind. Next, we have Wanik, Wanik Horn Miller. Wanik Horn Miller is a Bear Clan Mohawk hailing from the communities of Ganawage and Oswakan. She is currently a graduate student in Indigenous Studies and Kinesiology at the University of BC. Wanique was a key member of the Canadian women's water polo team that won gold at the 1990 Pan Am Games. Voted MVP, Wanique became co-captain and led her team to the Sydney Olympics in 2000. Wanique has been recognized with countless awards, including a National Aboriginal Achievement Award, the National Tom Longboat Award for Indigenous Athlete of the Year for Canada, and recently inducted into Canada's Sports Hall of Fame. She has worked as a sports commentator for CBC and APTN and has become a strong advocate for sport, fitness, and wellness. She also has traveled extensively throughout North America as a motivational speaker, sharing her journey from the front lines of the Oka crisis all the way to the Olympics with Indigenous and non-Indigenous audiences. As one of Canada's Indigenous Olympians, Wanique has used her passion and experiences in sport to influence Indigenous and non-Indigenous leadership towards making sport and wellness a community building priority. Welcome to you, Wanique. Where are you joining us from and how are you feeling today? You need to unmute Wanique so we can hear you. Technology. <laughs> and then earbuds falling out. <laughs> Um, I'm coming uh, to you from the unceded territory of the um, Algonquin people here in Ottawa. Uh, but uh, if you ask my mom, a whole bunch of Mohawks used to come through here as well. So, you know, this is the land of trade and, and uh, a lot of commerce. And I might have some kids coming in out of here because they're home from school. So um, <laughs> I'm really proud. And uh, I'm really, really proud to be part of this panel and I'm honored to be here uh, to share some, um, to share some of these much needed um, conversations and words about a really, really important um, issue that we've all faced as panelists. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are, you know, looking for solutions. So thank you so much. Thanks, Wanique. And lastly, we have the lovely Lyric Atchison. Lyric is a member of the Squamish Nation in North Vancouver, BC. She's in her fourth year in the kinesiology program at UBC in the interdisciplinary stream with a large focus and passion in sociology and gender, race, and social justice studies. She's a past BC Summer Games athlete. She's been a member of UBC Women's Varsity Rugby team and has even represented Canada at the U20 Tri-Nation Series. She is a past recipient of the Premier's Awards for Youth Excellence in Sport for BC, and also the 2019 National Tom Longboat Award winner for Top Indigenous Female Athlete for Canada. Lyric has traveled the world playing rugby and does not take her experiences in sport for granted. 
BC Rugby's Darcy Patterson has said this of Lyric. Lyric has true commitment to bettering herself and the others around her and sees sport as a vehicle to do so. Lyric's ambition to pursue higher level sport are also accompanied by her drive and dedication to excel academically. Lyric, we are excited to have you join this panel today. Welcome to you. Hello, where are you coming from and how are you feeling? Hello, I am coming from the traditional territory of the Musqueam people. I'm currently at UBC and I'm super excited and grateful to be here surrounded by these amazing people and panelists and talk, have the opportunity to talk about something that's super important. Thanks, Lyric. Well, welcome to you all. We look forward to engaging in some amazing dialogue and discussion and recognize that uh, some of you even have a bit of presentation to share with us as well. So um, in this first set and kind of opening up with a theme around decolonization, um, recognizing that anti-Indigenous policies and laws, systemic racism, legacy of the Indian residential schools, that these have contributed significantly to preventing Indigenous communities and people from fully participating in sport and physical activity. Alec, you are a survivor of the infamous Alert Bay Residential School, and you are featured in the Indigenous Sport Gallery at the BC Sports Hall of Fame's museum, where there's a quote featured prominently on the wall from you, speaking about your experience. And as part of that quote, you have said, Soccer was my saving grace, my sanity, while in residential school. I know you attribute sport as being a vehicle for freedom and a source of healing. In opening up our first theme, Alex, please can you share with us some of your incredible story and what does decolonization mean to you? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Lara. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I know as I was... Um, um, shifting through my memory bank. Uh, and thank you for um, reminding me of the residential school uh, experience itself. Because um, that's how I've kind of divided my, my presentation on. And um, I've got a, uh, I drew some inspiration from Chief Dan George. And um, it, it's an excerpt from his um, decolonizing, um, not decolonizing, um, centenary speech. And um, so I thought it was really appropriate and fitting for me to cite this, um, this excerpt. Oh, great spirit, give me back the courage of the olden chiefs. Let me humbly accept this, this new culture and through it rise up and go on like the thunderbirds of old. I shall rise again out of the sea. I shall grab the instruments of the white man's success, his education, his skills, and with these new tools, I shall build my race into the proudest segment of our society. I shall see our braves and our chiefs sitting in the house of law and government, ruling and being ruled by the knowledge and freedom of our great land. And I just thought that that seemed so, so fitting to um, give me a chronological, I guess, in my mind, my heart. And so I've got three um, little excerpts, uh, categories that I've, um, I've cited. And the first is I've called it decolonized. When I was a little boy, I lived in a, a little village that was still remote and beautifully, wonderfully remote. And there was a nature that uh, was just there. The river was there, the forests were there, the mountains were there. So when we think of physical activity, um, it's not defined. It just is who you are and what you've become. And um, you know, and, and the freedoms that happened within our villas, the communal life, the family life, the togetherness, it all just blended itself together to say, boy, I was a lucky little boy, a uh, little boy. And, um, and of course, uh, there's, there's another uh, picture of a, um, our chiefs. Uh, uh, where, where's, there you go. Um, we had a, uh, um, I guess the quick history here is that we are composed of four tribes and we were nomadic way back when, of course, and we didn't, um, we traveled independently. And, but anyway, in 1935, our, our chiefs got together to amalgamate. 
and so entered the four tribes and they were getting ready to prepare themselves and our future for what's happening today. So they erected a totem pole and uh, the totem pole symbolizes the four tribes of our villages. And, um, and at the time of the totem pole raising, it was, uh, there was an, a ban on our potlatch for 50 years. And so we asked permission if we could um, dedicate this totem pole to King George V, um, his passing, and then um, inauguration of King George VI. And of course, uh, they, the authorities couldn't say no. So there again, we now have a totem pole that stands there to remind us who we are and where we come from. And of course, all these figures have a legend, a story, a beginning, a creation, and on and on. And so as a young boy, I didn't really know, know what that meant at that time. And then I go uh, to the next phase, which I then called all those wonderful things from the first stage, then get interpreted and disrupted and uh, fractured by the second stage. And that's where I would say colonized um, notions come into play. That's where I entered the residential school and we know that our languages were taken away. Uh, we were taken away from our family, the wedging of family dynamics and uh, it was very strong. And, um, and so it just, I guess I can say it took me apart. It, it started to take me apart and I didn't know it at the time. And, um, and as Lara mentioned though, that um, I did recognize looking back on it, um, that soccer and sports was my saving grace while I was there. Um, but in all that, um, I then experienced the boarding home program, they call it. And they sent me further away from um, my local area. I ended up in Mission in the Fraser Valley and stayed there till I graduated and I went on to UBC. And I got very familiar with what we call a concrete jungle. And as opposed to our natural settings in um, our wonderful valley. And, um, ended up graduating and, um, and so with that, I just said that that phase of being colonized, of taking you away, your home and all that, and then feeding you an education that uh, seemed to smother the natural education I had in our valley. Um, I, I just say that was a continuance of this becoming colonized uh, and so then I come, I, I come back uh, to this third, and I now call it decolonized again. And that's where I now becoming an older person. I'm 74 years old. You have an opportunity to have a memory bank that's clear enough to, to acknowledge the phases of your life and what contributes to my current wellness and health. And um, so I then look at this um, experience of, um, looking back on this, what they call the um, stereotype image of our people, the dirty, lazy, drunken Indian. And uh, I looked at those titles as a stereotype, and I said to myself, I do not want to be that. I can't be that because I'm not that. And then I start to realize I have attacked each of those stereotype images as time unfolded in my life. I was not stupid. I went to university. I got a degree and what am I doing with that? You know, I had my moments with the drinking world. Yes, I was a drunk, but I'm healing from that. And so there again, this is a process of self-determination of where you can go with your personal life. And um, so uh, and there again, I started to um, be attracted to the sport leadership world. And I was real fortunate to be involved with with the Aboriginal Sports Association for 20 years. It was a provincial organization. Then we got affiliated with the Aboriginal Sports Circle, the national body. And then we, uh, I, I got engaged very deeply with the North American Indigenous Games, the, um, the international body. And what I found was, uh, especially with the Indigenous Games itself, it gave us the opportunity to, to direct our own destinies and how we conducted each other. And I just take so, like I mentioned earlier, I got three wonderful young ladies, you know, that I'm a panelist with. And we fought. We didn't really need to fight hard, but 
to profile the North American Indigenous Games as a balanced equity, you know, in, in um, male, female, and the representation in all our sport. And, uh, and so anyway, I saw that unfolding. And I said, whoa, we're on the right track of practicing respect and all that was taught to us by, by our elders and our way of life. Uh, um, came, uh, I, I just like to think the Indigenous Games was self-reliant. It, it guided itself using our leadership. So I just saw some of those generational growths, I guess. And I just try to follow this colonization, decolonizing, and colonizing again. So with that, I'll leave it at that. And there's so many <laughs> stories that could be told there. Um, but I did want to um, leave with this systems thinking. Um, I remember the uh, 1997 opening ceremonies. And, um, and we learned from our Salus nations here how they conduct themselves in protocol. They have a speaker and, um, and then you have a guest. And in this case, uh, the opening ceremonies, the usual order is federal, provincial, local, on and on. But um, we wrote to the minister, we phoned, let the minister of sport know that. Uh, we have a speaker um, to speak on your behalf. And, um, and the opportunity there is for that speaker to praise um, the minister in his own right, because we learn not to build or praise ourselves. And um, so at the opening ceremonies, um, that happened. And we were seen as violating protocol of saying, how could you not have allowed the Minister of Sport to speak? Uh, but she was allowed. She used a speaker to help her voice her intent. So anyway, I said, we just said that was a big house practice and we determined, and that was the final result. And at the end of the day, people were in admiration for what we had done. Um, they sent the minister, uh, minister of Indian Affairs our way, as opposed to the Minister of Sport, but she understood though. And um, so there again, it was just a simple, a powerful example of what starts to unfold at the leadership level. So with that, I'll leave it at that right now and go from there. Thank you, Lara. Thank you everybody for your attention. Thank you, Alec. Um, so I, I'm hearing you're using the word self-reliance, um, self-determination in talking about um, decolonization um, and how self-determination equates with things like the North American Indigenous Games. Uh, I think it's the late George Manuel, um, you know, one of the leaders of the Native Indian Brotherhood who has said, self-determination is the antidote to colonialism. I think it was George who said that. Um, and I think of games, like you said, the North American Indigenous Games being about self-determination. Um, can you share with our audience why the, the North American Indigenous Games needs to continue, why we need to continue supporting that institution? Um, you know, I think of you, Alec, at the 2017 North American Indigenous Games closing ceremony in front of the thousands of athletes up on stage, getting the chant going for the 94 calls, because um, NAG is recognized as uh, call number 88 in those 94 calls. So I wondered if you could just mm -hmm. speak a moment to uh, the importance of self-determination in things like the North American Indigenous Games and why we need to keep those games going. Yeah, thanks, Lara, for that. Um, I, I see this, this set of games as breathing in, breathing out. And where I'm going with this right now, it always ends up and comes in your lap personally, you know, as um, an individual, and it connects to your family, that connects to your community. And I know that we call it in Indian country, this time of the year, we're all getting ready for Indian soccer season. And Indian soccer season brings together the tribes, the nations, individuals, the athletes, and they all join 
as one to become one. And then we uh, use that as our, um, I guess, our base for development. And then as a provincial organization, we're charged with uh, developing Team BC. Well, we look toward those development notions to help us send forward um, team representation from BC. Then they go and engage in the North American Indigenous Games with national, international. And now you're promoting this youthful spirit and they're meeting other youthful spirits in North America, you know, with the guidance of our leaders. And I say, it sounds simple in its own way, but it has very, very deep in my mind experiences and teachings. And so this empowerment piece, this working towards self-development and self-reliance, it's happening. And I keep saying that Indigenous Games is a real awesome um, tool and instrument and the games to hold on to. Um, thanks, Lara. Thank you, Alec. I'd um, like to ask any of our other panelists, maybe I'll turn to Rosalind first, if you would like to add anything to in response to Alex's um, commentary um, on the topic of decolonization, self-determination, what might reconciliation in sport look like to you? So Rosalind, would you like to offer any words? Thank you, um, Elder Alex Nelson for sharing. And I really um, support your um, around North American Indigenous Games. I think it's extremely valuable for our youth to have a platform for them to compete in. And um, I'm also um, a big fan of the World Indigenous Nations Games, um, Dr. Will Child, that happens as well, um, you know, annually. And, and I think that uh, for our people to, to be able to participate in a culturally safe space with our families and to be able to uh, practice our ways of being spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically healthy and empowered is extremely powerful. And, and um, Elder Alex Nelson, I'm just so glad that you're involved in sports. You, you've been a strong mentor um, for me for a long time. And we need more people who have are healthy role models. And sports is one of the great platforms where we connect and, and we meet people like yourself. And Meg Games as well is, is one of those places where people come and they get to be around, have a sense of belonging, you know, really have a sense of belonging and, and really, um, rebuild our ways of knowing. So thank you so much for sharing, Kuksham. Thank you, Rosalind. Lyric, I'm going to turn to you for a moment just to offer if you have any um, words in response to, to Alec. You are you're an active elite athlete right now I'm competing at the varsity level, at the national level. And know how important sport is and you know we've had Alex share with us the the freedom that sport can bring and how that links to self-determination and self-reliance um, how has that resonated with you um yeah I think that nag is great I never had the opportunity to go but just in terms of um, from a rugby perspective, um, I participate with Thunder Rugby, which is an Indigenous um, team um, that usually gathers on Vancouver Island um, in the summers. And I think that having the opportunity to gather, um, you know, all Indigenous people from across the province is um, super empowering. And to take a sport like rugby um, that, you know, was invented by colonizers and taking that into our own communities and celebrating our culture and just understanding each other and having the opportunity to come together and celebrate a sport that we all love um, and culture as well is a super important thing. And I'm something I'm really grateful to have been a player for and a coach for as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Lyric. Juanique, I think some of what Alex said about um, the references to his surroundings as uh, you know, growing up in Kinkan Inlet and you know, being surrounded by the mountains and, and, and the water and all of the nature in his surroundings and being taken away from that place, that, that the impact that that can have. I think this segues really well into the next theme, the next question. Um, that relationship between physical activity, sport, and place. So um, I'd like to shift into the next theme over to you, Juanique, with the question, what is the relationship between physical activity, sport, and place in your eyes? Over to you, Juanique. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you, Alex, and Lyric, and uh, Dr. Miles. 
you know, I, I, I think about uh, this topic of decolonization and I just, as we segue into my piece, one of the things that I really wanted you guys to keep in your formal and really stuck in the fore part of my mind is when he talked about uh, the, you know, the Indian Act and being taken away uh, from a place where he felt whole. And then in residential school, they proceeded to pick him apart. And so when you look at, um, you know, institutions like the sports system in Canada, um, you know, it's, it, you know, and you wonder what does systemic racism mean? What, why are, what, what does decolonizing mean? It means that a person like an indigenous person going into a sporting team or a sporting world in a community doesn't have to pick themselves apart to fit in. They don't have to leave pieces of themselves at the door, but they can bring those powerful pieces of themselves within to that house and they can paint the walls with, and, and they can strengthen. And colonization really looked at indigenous people as having nothing to offer, nothing to contribute. And so they colonized our ways with their ways. And what we're trying to do is we are trying to, you know, like, I love that saying, um, you know, they tried to bury us, but they didn't know we were, you know, we were seeds and we were growing, right? And that's kind of what decolonization, I see it happening through Lyric and through different people and, uh, and, and just, you know, the North American Indigenous Games being a place where I competed in five of them as an athlete. And I was very lucky to be at those, Sarah, those games that you were um, running, Alex. And I was, a, I was just a kid and the most powerful moments of my life, that was the seed where I felt whole. And I always tell people that I, it was the one place I felt whole as an athlete. So I just get to my presentation. I know I've probably taken up half my time. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, to uh, to honor what he had to say and, and just kind of put it in a, an understanding that I could share. So, all right, go through the, just because we don't have a lot of time. Um, like I said, I'm coming to you from, uh, from the unceded territory of the Algonquin people. And uh, to the next slide, please. And here's a lovely picture of me with my pre-COVID hair. <laughs> we're not allowed to see hairdressers here in Ontario so and this is just some of uh, who I am and uh, like I said uh, these are more important to me now than ever because I'm a mother of three children and uh, it's really um, it's really important that we discuss these and and we do the heavy lifting of our children for our children you know we do that heavy lifting so they don't have to do it. So having these hard discussions and talking about these things in a way that we can find solutions is really important. So next, please. So I, um, you know, I'm looking at this, you know, when it, when it came to my experiences uh, in sport, you know, I, one of the things that I, I really experienced at a very young age was the whole concept of systemic racism and, and, and what did that mean? And I didn't really understand as a young competitive swimmer, competitive runner, I was, I was completely um, blindsided. And it was interesting because my mother chose sport for me. She, she was specifically understood, my mother being an indigenous rights activist in the 60s, she um, understood the power of sport and what it could help me achieve, not just in sport, but in life. And so she chose sports for us that weren't judged and non-team sports. So running and swimming. So we could, she used to say, I wanted to minimize your nativeness. Like that, that, that would be a problem that they wouldn't look at you and go, we're not choosing you because you don't look like everybody else or you don't act like everybody else. It was basically, if I, I had a right to get on that, on that, those blocks and I had a right to race and I could, if I won, I was the winner. And she wanted us to have that experience in sport. But you know, <laughs> When you look at sport and when I kind of evolved and my career evolved into water polo, you know, we talk about, you know, it's racism in Canada and it's not always as overt as we don't like you, you're not allowed to come in here, you know, please leave, you know, that type of thing. It tends to uh, express itself in sort of an indifference, like the concept of, I don't see race. You know, that has been said to me more than that, more than once. I don't see race. Well, what that says to me is you don't see me. You don't see who I am. You don't see all that I come from, all my responsibilities. What is my role in my family, my, my clan, my community? And that's that indifference. And then the intolerance of, you know, anything 
that I did that was different. And when I became co-captain of an Olympic team, I brought with me not only my own experience in leadership, but generations and generations behind me of ancestors that I have that are war chiefs and the teachings that I brought with me about what it meant to be a leader and how I was supposed to carry myself and how I was supposed to help others. And that was really, really important to me and no one could understand that. And then, you know, when we talk about intergenerational traumas, you know, when our athletes, you know, when they, when they would hit the wall or when they would experience some things where it would kind of reinforce that, inter that trauma of their forefathers. Like I used to get told all the time in my, you know, working up my way in on the national team and stuff, like, just wait, they're going to get you. You're going to be too different. Just wait. And I never understood that. And it was because of we, it, it was an experience. And so, you know, as an, uh, you know, a, a master's student getting a chance to kind of unpack this experience in an academic sense and contribute in some humble way to uh, the study of, you know, you know, decolonization of sport, it's been really important to me to really define things like making space, making um, space for who you are within that system. It, basically making room in that house in which you're going into for who you are and not having to pick apart yourself to fit in, leaving some of the most powerful things of who you are uh, at the door because they don't fit the culture of sport. So next, next uh, slide, please. <laughs> um, so what does that mean? How are we strengthened? Um, these were things like I've been raised in a longhouse, uh, traditional ways of my people. Um, I'm also very uh, humbled to be a, a sun dancer. These are ways, that, the strengthening ways in which I've strengthened myself uh, within the mainstream world. And one of the most important things I say when I talk to young people is, these are really, really relevant in your everyday life. These, you know, how when you go on to this team uh, and, and often mix, mixed races, mixed cultures, mixed um, uh, spiritual beliefs, um, bringing who you are and bringing who I was as an Indigenous person and the practices of, say, for instance, getting ready for battle, um, the practices of the warrior, these are things that I shared. You know, I also developed ways in which language and self-talk were really important. And this is something that is even more important to me as we are talking about um, the, the resurgence of Indigenous languages. Words like kanadunkwatsara, which is a Mohawk word for um, the most powerful energy in the world, that's love. And that's where you're supposed to make decisions from. You know, that's an important thing where you can take, you know, piecing yourself back together, our languages, our cultures into being relevant. You know, honoring the water, the water is life. We talk a lot about that, but I, I'll never forget when I was getting ready to compete at the um, Olympic qualifying tournament in Winnipeg in 1999, um, we had an elder, they brought in an elder from uh, the, the, the community. Um, I know his son, because I ran across Canada with him, I saw his father, I still, I can see his face, I can't, I can't remember his name, but he honored the water and he did a whole, right and all these people from around the world and nobody was paying attention and it was like this it was huge it was magical it had never happened to me before at an international competition and probably the most uh, important international competition I was going to compete at in my life and you know having traditional elders and knowledge keepers be uh, not just these sideliners but relevant everyday um, contributors to the strength uh, is, is very important and creating that space within yourself, within the team. What are those teachings and how can we translate them to be something that is motivating and, and protective of ourselves? And, you know, now I guess what I'm doing is I'm doing the seven generations paying it forward. Um, that was one of the greatest things that um, a fellow Mohawk and, and one of my role models, Alan Moore, said to me when I got from the Olympics. He says, okay, you know, what are you doing now to make opportunities for those who come after you. This is where the hard work comes from, but this is where a good athlete then becomes a great person, a great part of the community. And, you know, I think that having all of these, including places of offering and community ancestors, this is how a person remains whole rather than having to pick themselves apart. 
And if we can make places, if we can do this to strengthen the whole, and I tried to do that when I was the deputy chef de mission for Team Canada at the Pan Am Games. I tried to bring the strength and power of who I was as a Mohawk woman into the, uh, the, the team as a whole. And I, I wanted to show them that, you know, we are, we are power, we are resilience, we are incredible strength, and you want to be a part of us. <laughs> and that's basically what I tried to do. So I think the last slide, I know I'm trying, trying not to be so talkative, but I am Mohawk and I apologize. <laughs> um, and, you know, having, having this physical, the, 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 the relationship between physical activity and sport and place is really, um, it, it's so important on so many levels. But it was so important to me because I knew I tried so hard in, to be me, to be the most powerful version of me. And throughout my career, um, you know, that, that wasn't always something that was always um, respected or honored. Um, it made people fearful often of who I was and Un, they felt I was unpredictable um, and all these things. And that's when you don't start fitting who they want you to be, you know? And that was a weird thing because in my career, I was also used to promote. My indigeneity was used, my indigenousness was promoting my sport. I was put on the cover of magazines and things like that. And, but when my actions, when I really, started to try and change the culture of my sport in a way that I understood um, the way that I could protect my teammates and the way I could make it better, a safer place for, for all people. Then I suddenly became a team cohesion problem. And that is part of systemic racism when, the, when you don't fit anymore. And so I think if we, if we can make space, if we can look at some of the um, some of the efforts that are around the world where Indigenous people have um, empowered the the spaces of the sport, like in Aotearoa or New Zealand, where they've done concerted efforts to empower the Olympic movement with Maori ways of knowing and doing and strengthening, and and we see that we see that how it's strengthened the nation as a whole. I think if we can do that in Canada, if we can, you know, understand that that diversity and that diverse way of knowing and strengthening will make this place a powerful place where not only Indigenous people will flourish, but all people, including all the settlers that have, have been here, but all the new new newcomers that are coming to our land. And so I'm sorry, I, I feel like I'm in a that five minute <laughs> that limit, so I think I'm done. Not as finesse as I normally am, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anik. That that that's incredible. Really appreciate you speaking to the the spaces and the connection to places. Um, we have we have 500 people joining us here today, and you know we know we were welcoming a Q and A entries into the Q and A. We have assistants that will be polling those questions. We'll see if we can get to as many as we can. So we want to make sure we're slotting in some time for the panelists to be able to address some of your questions in the audience there today. But Wanik, I'd like to go back to um, you talking about um, the connection for tying uh, Indigenous identity to support. Um, but I'm sure in this audience of 500 people, we've got community leaders, health leaders, recreation managers, whether they're working in Indigenous communities or non. Is there something tangible that they can take away today as an example of how, how Indigenous communities can use culture to promote physical activity and sport? Well, um, you know, this has been something that uh, was a journey for me because um, the initial uh, feeling I had was I had to park, that was one of the things I had to park at the door, right? And if you're a coach or a community leader or, or someone who is trying to create a space, a team culture, as I would say, that team culture that's inclusive, you know, one of the most important things about sport is it can help someone find out where they when they get their motivation from having these discussions with your athletes because you know we often look at sport as being like well you're going to go to the olympics right like no 
one of the most important conversations is what, why are you here? Why are you here? What do you hope to get? What do you hope to contribute? And making sure that you know, um, and if they, if they're, if sport is a way in which they are going to learn about their culture and they, they get that opportunity. Um, I think that, you know, bringing in and, and, and including family, uh, including elders, uh, reaching out and, and trying to find a way to help, uh, indigenous athletes, um, be, have a safe space where they can, um, delve into some of those conversations with themselves. I think that is, um, is a conversation I would have liked to have as a young athlete. Is someone to ask me, why are you here? Who are you here for? Um, you know, I was, uh, I remember standing behind the blocks. Every time I would race, you know, I'd be at provincials and, and getting ready for the final of the 50 meter freestyle, or 100 meter freestyle. Those are my races. I was a sprinter, right? I'm 11, 12 years old. And, you know, everybody else is standing there and they're stretching. And I just would shut my eyes. And I would say, please let me make my family proud. Please let me make my ancestors proud. Please let me do my best and just let them be proud. And that's why I raced. I raced because I was trying to make my people proud and try to show them what we were made of. And I felt like every, you know, sometimes when you're, you know, given those opportunities to show just a, a pinpoint of the brightness that exists within our people. It's such an honor, you know, that they look at you and uh, they go, wow, you know, I wanted people to look at me and go, wow, I want to be like her, you know? So I think that, um, I think, and I, th I think culture, you know, if we can have those spaces and we can have those conversations, we can have the Alex Nelsons of the world and Wilton Littlechilds um, be more integral parts of, of those spaces. I think, it would be uh, it would be strengthening for everybody. Yeah, thank you, Ani. Completely agree. That connection to cultural pride and unity. If there's ways to create that and build that. It can absolutely bring bring more participation to the fore. Um, I do want to move ahead with um, moving into the next presentation. I'm just conscious of time. I know I'd love to have panelists responding more to Anik's presentation, but want to give Dr. Rosalyn an opportunity um, to start looking at um, that the teaching and the coaching side of things. So, you know, Rosalyn, you have a, a really long history in sport leadership and coaching, physical education, um, and love to hear from you about your perspective on how can we decolonize teaching and decolonize coaching techniques and styles and even competitive environments so love to invite you to speak more about that. Uh, Lara, thank you so much for um, the introduction and inviting me to be part of this panel. Winik, thank you so much for your strong words and, and I just appreciate all the work we've been doing on cultural space uh, and, and tying it into your personal experience. I remember the first time I met you and I was like oh wow another warrior woman. I just you just you just your energy is amazing. So thank you so much for sharing that. And, and I'm, I'm kind of more boring. I'm, I'm going to do an academic approach and I just like to pull up my presentation and ground myself uh, with uh, the work that we do at the University of British Columbia. And I just really want to acknowledge um, Dr. Darren Warburton for providing me with a, a really safe space to um, do this work in. So it's, it's a real honor and a privilege. I'd like to go to the next slide, please. And again, I like to really uh, recognize the Hunkamun speaking people of, of Musqueam community. Um, I have personal bonds and family ties uh, with a lot of the people here uh, on the reserve where I live and in the community where I thrive and I bring my family to. So, um, Kuksham, thank you for having me here. Next slide. So my history is really long. I, I, the sports have been my life. I, so I've been alive now for 55 years and so, uh, it's grounded everything I've done from academics to being an athlete. I started with softball and played professional in Japan. And then I came back to Canada and I competed in powerlifting and competed until 2008 in the nationals and where I won the gold uh, a few times. And I, I my schooling by being a coach at all the universities I went to. So I, I was a strength and conditioning coach for the women's soccer team at UBC. And then I was um, brought in to work with the University of Central Florida with Michelle Akers at University of Central Florida. Um, and then I went to University of Arizona after that. So it's, it's a really um, part of who I am. And I, I always say at UBC is, well, not our job, it's, it's we reflect 
uh, sports, recreation, physical activity, traditional activities, and everything we do is on our job that really defines us. And I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Next slide. So I want to talk about colonization. So um, when we think about colonization, we really have to be aware that it's, it exists strongly right now. Um, the loss of traditional land is still, we still don't have treaties. You know, we still don't have settlements. We, Musqueam, um, UBC campus is Musqueam's land, you know, and, and that hasn't been resolved. So we have huge impacts of colonization to this date. We're still in court and doing legal claims, um, trying to bring back some of our land to our people so we can have homes. Segregation reserves, you know, um, as I share, you know, I do live on reserve here and, and there's a difference in, in what we have for resources available. So we have over 198 First Nation communities that have in BC that are on reserves and they don't have the same access to municipal like recreation and sports. Indian agents, um, again, um, Alex Nelson, um, sorry, you know, like my, my heart just reaches out to you to all Indian residential school survivors, you know, having to be removed from your parents, from your home, from your culture, your language, all your ways of knowing. Um, it's just, it's devastating, it's traumatic. And I don't believe that people really do heal. I think the goal of healing is, is I think it's a, it's a colonial perspective. I think it becomes a part of who you are. Um, my father was a residential school survivor as well from St. George's and Lytton and I, uh, you know, you have to love people where they're at. Unconditional support, unconditional love. And that's how we have growth and that's how we have healing. Systemic racism in sports, education, health, legal, marriage, etc. It's real. Uh, racism exists to this day. I've experienced racism. Unfortunately, my young daughter, who's um, did adapt for station, she's experienced racism. And when you when you when you experience, you don't know how to define it. You know something happened, you feel oppressed, you feel you don't feel equal. And you kind of go, why? What is that feeling? You know, it might not be directly to your face to say that, oh, your First Nations, you're fortunate because your school was paid for. That's why you went to school forever. I've had those comments to me. And, you know, it's, it's, I'm like, no, that's not true. But people feel they can have these negative thoughts. And what it does, it really invalidates the work that you've done to create yourself, to create your space and to have success. Next slide. So just to kind of, um, I know a lot of everyone's been sharing in the chat line, which is phenomenal, like where you're from. I just love to see the acknowledgement of the traditional territory where you're from, really tying yourself to the community, to the people. You know, um, at UBC, I was walking behind a building one day and they had these row of trees that said planted in 1926, 1927, 1928, each tree, and it was recognizing um, the history of that tree. And I, and I thought to myself, in 1926, where were the Musqueam people when this tree was planted, you know, and how were they acknowledged, you know, and just really reflecting on where you're at and at the time, where were our people at that time? Have we been empowered to heal holistically in our communities? So where I'm from in St. George's Residential School, when it was torn down, um, or it was, we tore it down in the 1980s, um, we were one of the first schools that came out about all the abuses and traumas of the students. Uh, and there was nothing put in place. There was nothing, there was no healing centers, no recognition of what the effect was for children not to have parents around to grow up in homes. And were the Indian, Indian residential school survivors given healing and nurturing to learn how to be parents? You know, so it's a big journey to learn how to become a parent for myself um, when your own parents didn't have the, you know, weren't surrounded by family. Next slide. So decolonization, teaching and coaching. So one of the things we've really um, practiced in our department of program is co-creation. So you start from the very beginning, whenever you want to create something um, for our communities, we need to include our people. So, and, and not just one elder and knowledge keeper, you bring in community members, you have discussions. So we may, ha we may have thoughts of what sports or health and wellness looks like in a community. However, we cannot create that without them. So co-creation is vital and including knowledge keepers and elders. So people who may have ties to language, ties to protocols, ties to medicines is really important. And strength-based. So when we talk about being physically active, we don't come from a perspective that, oh, we're gonna prevent disease. Being physically active is more about 
creating holistic balance. And so when we go into a community, we don't say, do your 10,000 steps so you can prevent diabetes. It's like, no, we're, we're going to walk with our families. We're going to practice our, our tr traditional ways of gathering foods and berries and fishing and hunting. And that's how we promote being physically active, not to prevent diseases. Include diverse indigenous ways of knowing. So I, I have my culture, my traditions, and traditions can be new or old. You know, a lot of times we, traditions doesn't mean it's an old way of doing things. It's just ways your family and your community create new practices. So really making sure that we understand that everyone's experience is different and there's not just one way of being Indigenous. Um, teaching and coaching outcomes are, once we co-create programs or sports or activities is that we go back and share successes. We make a full circle. It's really important for us to be inclusive and to not just go into a community and do your work and then just leave. Um, my work in Moscow is forever. My relationships here are forever. Um, same with my own people, my community. Um, I, I, they're family. Next slide. So including elders in cultural space. We didn't talk about cultural space. It's been some work that um, her and I and with Maddie Chow and Jeva Tomaski and Kai Kaufman, we've been working on research on cultural space and also uh, creating a model for Indigenous support motivation. And I'm sensitive of time, so I'm going to go to the next slide. So these words come up when we talk about um, colonization, when we talk about racism, you know, oppression. So the one thing I really want to reflect on here is that these things also happen within our Indigenous community. So we have experiences that, of colonization, you know, we have experiences that, of racism. However, unfortunately, you know, residential school and division of communities on reserves and um, fighting for resources it has caused a lot of negative things within our communities. And how do we create a sense of belonging with each other? How do we empower each other? How do we share aspirations? So that's things really, and you know, one of the words I really like is, is, is as dangerous as bullying and tolerance is ambivalence, is that when you see someone who's being oppressed, how do you advocate for them in a good way where you're being heard? So how do you uh, share that knowledge? And so as being a new, um, you know, Indigenous scholar at UBC, how do we advocate for our students? How do we advocate for our programs? And how do we advocate for our sports in a way that's productive? And um, it's really important for us to take that responsibility on seriously. Next slide. So this is a concept that we've been hammering out probably for more than a year, Monique. <laughs> and uh, we started off with just sharing a lot of stories and a lot of information. And, and, and when we think about holistic conditions, ways of knowing, most of the time we reflect on the medicine wheel, but I really want to um, share, you know, the medicine wheel is shared in all communities, but we really want to focus on what does that mean emotionally, spiritually, physically, and mentally? And what does it mean to you? So self-determination. So in 1999, back in the day in the 1900s, I wanted to be a football coach. I wanted to be in the NFL. And I thought I'm gonna get my master's in human kinetics. I'll become a strength and leadership coach. I'm, I'm gonna use my power, my strength, and I'm gonna motivate the most warrior-like people I know, which are football players. So I moved to Florida and I became a strength and conditioning coach. And I became a, um, a football coach as well at the high school. And people were like, why are you doing this? Why, why do you wanna do this? And, it was a place where I felt I could be myself. I could walk on the field and go, let's go. I could walk down the field and tell everyone line up and we're gonna fight, you know? And it was a place where I could, I could yell, be myself and empower people to be strong. And for me, that was, that was owning who I was spiritually. It was, and I didn't have to apologize for, for my strength. The next one is resiliency. So the challenge is when you own your power, when you own your strengths, when you have a vision for yourself, you get tested. And you may sometimes be told that you don't belong. And, and you have these experiences where like when they share, um, you have pieces pull, pull off you. So you reflect on the seven generations before you and the resiliency to, for you to be here, the gifts that you have. And the next is self-actualization. So 
Self-actualization does not happen within self. It happens with empowerment from other people, from community, from family. I was, I've always been very fortunate where I've had people open doors for me. So whenever I try to fight, fight, fight to belong somewhere and it doesn't happen, I just kind of like look for a door to open where I can become self-actual. You know, I've received, I've had a lot of rejection in my life. I, I, I fought really hard in school, you know, to be successful and um, self-actualization does not happen by, by yourself. It happens with other people advocating for you and, and being there and creating space for you to be there, to be who you are. And another thing that was stressed on was reciprocity. Um, at no time can I ever be successful without sharing that success with others. So the responsibility to give back to my family, to give back to my community, to give back to my, our country um, is, is extremely important. And so with my national nonprofit, um, Indigenous Physical Activity and Cultural Circle, we have a national conference we host every year to create a space for other people like me who need a sense of belonging, who are doing really good work and are really positive around sports, recreation, fitness, and traditional activities. And they want to share their practices. They want to share the successes. And our last conference at Masco Cheese was, oh, we had, I think like a hundred children from the high school come in. And I, I was moved to tears because they were meeting people who were, who were in their field of sports and in their field of being active and having careers, we're making a difference in our, in our community. And then you come back to the full circle and I'm gonna close on this. I'm not gonna to go to the next slide because I know we're running out of time. Is that you come back and you reflect again, you reflect on spiritually, you know, how am I being successful in sports or physical activity or in teaching emotionally, mentally, physically. So how, how are we being successful in the four different components? So it's really important for us to be aware and grounded in our ways of knowing. And thank you so much for listening, Kuksham, on my relations. Wow, incredible stuff, Rosalind. Thank you so much for sharing that, that amazing presentation. Um, you, you mentioned the word belonging uh, as part of that pathway to self-actualization. Um, I know when we're talking about self-actualization, we're looking at reaching that full, personal potential um, that you can achieve as an individual where um, you know all your basic needs have been fulfilled and you're able to reach that that top potential in an individual. Um, I, I'd love to have the panelists respond to to your presentation because I mean we're, we're talking about how to decolonize um, spaces with with teaching and with coaching techniques and with styles uh, and lyric you you're as an athlete I mean you probably know very well the importance of belonging um, that pathway to your self-actualization and love to give you an opportunity to respond to Rosalind's words yeah so just to kind of continue on with Rosalind's words and also Juanique um I was lucky when I started playing rugby, I had an indigenous coach, um, Brad Baker. So I never felt that I had to leave any part of myself um, at the door. Like we shared a common experiences. We understood each other from the same nation. But as I got older and as I moved on to like provincial university um, national teams, that's when I started like hitting that wall where I was like, okay, I don't feel like who I am as an Indigenous woman and the sport I play can coexist. Um, so I kind of started hitting that wall. And, you know, I've had a coach say to me, I, I told them I was Indigenous and they said, oh, you're going to play that card. Like it's a card that I have to play. Um, and so hearing that as an Indigenous person, it's really hard. And as an athlete, um, it's really discouraging. Um, and you kind of just box yourself in even more. Um, and Alex talked about the beginning, um, you know, stereotypes. So then I started just not telling people who I was because I was afraid that they were gonna judge me or um, look at me differently. And in a hyper-competitive environment, everyone is so focused on a goal or winning usually. And so there's even less space to speak up or be who you are. Um, and so I think, um, it comes down to, a, you know, university or national level or any level, um, giving space to people to bring who they are to the table and not 
um, trying to make them fit what you know you want or um, your agenda. Um, and so for me, an idealized decolonized sport environment would be for people like myself and other indigenous people to be able to speak up without fear of being repercussions or being looked at differently. And um, I think a lot of time coaches also, when you reveal your identity, they look to you for all the answers and all the knowledge. And I can only speak so much as an indigenous person and everyone's experiences are different. So I think trying to incorporate, you know, elders and other knowledge, not just looking to that one player to be the voice for so many people. Um, so yeah, it's a big, it can be a big burden to bear. So I think trying to incorporate um, just more would really help. Thank you, Eric. That's fantastic. We we've got a, a really big influx of questions. Um, many of them actually on a, on the same kind of theme. Um, so it's 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 coming off of what uh, Rosalind and Lyric has been talking about. Some of the actual tangible things that that leaders or sport administrators or coaches can do. So you know, questions to what are some things we can do to help attract more young Indigenous students to participate in sport. How can current sport programs from a municipal to national scale be more inclusive to all? Um, what sorts of things need to be in place to keep Indigenous athletes in sport physical activity? Lots of questions kind of on that theme. So um, love to have Alec, if you would like to weigh in on some of the, and Juanique, so Juanique and Alec just asking you to respond to, again, some of those, those items, the, the takeaways that our audience can have here about how to decolonize sport and physical activity spaces and make um, those spaces more welcoming and inviting and inclusive. Alec? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Lara. Um, there's just two um, uh, quick stories and they're similar in um, focus. Um, I remember going to our conferences, our national conferences, and I hear stories about the hockey, hockey world and how um, our um, coaches, our families knew who the potential hockey players were that could reach the NHL. And um, so there's, um, so they go on to go and get measured, they go assessed and on and on. And other coaches would agree that, yeah, they're NHLers. But when it comes to training time and that commitment to be there, to be away from community and then a behavior changed changes and where they don't want to try out anymore and um so it was a real strong message to me of how strong uh, family ties are and to try to um um i, I guess call on a um an individual to, to make a full commitment to this professional direction. Um, it didn't always turn out that way. And I, I, I remember that. And then I swing over to my nephew who became a professional soccer player. And we went to Winnipeg to visit him. And, um, and that's where I, I witnessed the loneliness, the aloneness. Uh, and he was the only indigenous person on that team. And um, so it became real clear to me what young people when they're that committed and uh, what they're what they're up against, and that's the family. But at the same time, he then cites though I can call my family anytime, you know. So he was satisfied with that as um, I guess a connector. But uh, I guess that just stands out in my mind as far as um, how do we encourage and, and try to understand how strong family dy dynamics are, and um, and I think today's technology, of course, is is very helpful in the Zoom thing. Um, but um, those two quick illustrations uh, tells me a story there. Thanks. Monique, I know you're dying to weigh in as well. Thank you, Alec. Monique? You know, I get, I get asked that question quite a bit. And I'm just going to use also, um, just building on what Alec said. Um, so I play water polo. I still play uh, much slower, <laughs> much less finesse but I don't drown, which is really important. And I play in a club. I started playing water polo in Ottawa. Um, and I, when I came back, uh, I wanted to find a club uh, that was like, would allow me to play. Cause I knew 
well, if I want my kids to play, I'm going to have to play. And I wanted them to get involved. So there was this club in Ottawa, Capital Wave, um, and it was started by this, um, these Indigenous family from Peru. And if you know about them, they're extremely family oriented, just like we are. And they really fought to make a club that was like a family environment. And, you know, over the last few years, uh, we have about five Indigenous athletes uh, of all different ages playing at the club, uh, plus my two kids. And one of the most uh, incredible things is that, like, you know, I'm still playing, I've got to be visible, uh, you know, but the fact that, um, you know, we, we were figuring out, okay, so how can we get more young girls to play water polo? Uh, initially, they, 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 they're really into metrics, this, this, the, the head coach, Rodrigo, and he said, okay, so we want to try to attract 20 uh, athletes. I said, well, you know what, um, anyway, I can help. And I was always, you know, I can't be there on the ground. So he managed uh, to get the board of this club, uh, rather than looking for outside money, he said, a board, can you make 10 scholarships for Indigenous girls to play water polo? And they approved it. And that's all from internal funding. And he came back to me and said, he was so excited. It took him a whole year to get here and in the middle of COVID and everything, but he, he managed to get that, uh, that little bit of money internally in the club. And he says, what, how do we find these girls? And so I reached out to the local friendship center and uh, working with the after school uh, program director. And, and she said, I got 10, I got 15 girls <laughs> that will play. I said, well, you are gonna have to find uh, a lot of these young, um, uh, young women don't have someone who can drive them there and pick them up. They need that support of, of someone getting them there. And so when you wanna know how to make um, uh, the place, like I, I, I sought what Alex understood, family. Family was important to me. and. I wanted to be part of something that was important is creating that sense of, of inclusion um, and, and, and creating that sense of, of welcome. But within these club programs, um, you know, we often like, okay, well, federal government, we wait on this external thing. And I just said, well, I didn't, I don't know how to access any of that fun, funding or whatever. Let's try to do something internally. And it was the will of the, of the club itself that was, able to find that money and that support and then just you know my contacts in the community so it's about creating relationships it's about creating a strategic plan within your club to say you know we want to make more um, opportunities for indigenous athletes this is one of the calls to action so we're going to go out of our way we're going to use our own money like our own money and we're going to get more of these girls to play and you know that happened in the united states um brenda via one of the three-time olympic gold medal water polo player a uh, Mexican girl came from a program of a water polo program within commerce. This is one of the poorest ghettos in LA. She was, hand, she was picked out and, and asked to play. And she went on to be captain of their Olympic team to become, you know, three gold medals. I'm not saying that that is the, the, the focus of this, but the, the you know, you, you create opportunity, you partner with the indigenous community, you become inclusive, you become family oriented. Um, it's not just good for Indigenous athletes, but it's good for the entire club itself and the entire community itself. So that's just one example of how that can be done. Amazing. Thank you, Monique. I know, um, Rosalind, you, you talked about the, the holistic approach or a holistic model and those references to, to the medicine wheel and um, even beyond the, um, the scope of the, the, the medicine wheel. I just want to touch on the holistic model really quickly. Um, we know that that's a part of the holistic model is introduced to coaches through the Aboriginal coaching modules course that's delivered through um, CAC and the Aboriginal sports circle. Um, and in that workshop, many times uh, people get uh, part of the exercise can be looking at what are the physical needs of an athlete that's really easy for coaches to to answer. Um, another one that that's that's easy is what are the intellectual needs or the mental or emotional needs of an athlete, how can we, we nurture and, and meet those needs? Um, cultural needs. So that course can help start answering the cultural needs. And where often it can be a real challenge is looking at the spiritual needs. How, how do you nurture the spiritual needs of an athlete? Um, and I think that you, you've helped reveal some of that. And it's about the self-actualization part. It's about belonging. It's about building connection. I mean, spirit really is uh, looking at 
spirituality as uh, something that is bigger than ourselves um, and being able to feed feed our souls and to feed our spirit and and that comes through belonging um, connection the, the self-actualization the, the respect feeling valued as an athlete um, lyric i mean you talked about needing to not always wanting to be drawn upon as the the one you know indigenous knowledge keeper on your team when you may not always feel that that's that's your place and that's your role and, that, and that's your expertise um so i really appreciate the, the talk about belonging i know we have andrea carey from inclusion incorporated with us today who has her own series of bridges of belonging um where that's that that's the main theme obviously is around belonging and great ways to nurture spirit and soul so I'm just conscious again of time. We are we're very closely approaching to to an end, and um, want to have a chance uh, to to invite Lyric to speak about what we're all kind of facing today. Obviously, it's we're in the middle of a global pandemic, and it, we're we're all here online, and that's the beauty of Zoom is it's giving us a chance to to connect to connect virtually. Um, but want to um, ask you to just provide some perspective about how has COVID impacted physical activity and sport in whether it's in Indigenous communities or for you um, personally as an athlete um, and how how can we all support one another? Lyric. Um, yeah, so I'm really lucky that here at UBC we have a lot of staff and people dedicated to allow us to train um, safely and following protocols. Um, but I understand that's not the case for everyone. Um, I mean, even when I go back home, like the Squamish Nation is very in an urban place and close to like a lot of um, rec centers, fields, places to get outside and get active. Um, but I'm also cognizant that a lot of indigenous communities and reservations are not in very urban areas. And so programs where, you know, they might bring people in to do group workouts or team events, obviously can't happen right now as it's not safe. Um, so that's obviously very difficult. And then I, like I touched on earlier, having um, teams like Thunder Rugby or all indigenous teams where you can come together and celebrate culture um, is obviously very difficult right now. And so I think, um, I mean, I'm personally really missing that, having the opportunity to go coach somewhere in a different community or talk to other athletes in other communities. Like that, that's not really possible right now. So I'm definitely missing that connection and um, celebrating culture and um, sport um, together. So that's something I really miss. And I imagine uh, many of you on the panel also miss. And um, so, yeah. Thanks, Lyric. So with just uh, you know five minutes left, we may go five minutes past our time, given that we, we started just a few minutes past at 12 o'clock. So those who are able to stick around, um, we, will, we will ask our, our panelists to address some of the questions that are coming in. One of the big ones, there's another theme that's coming through in the questions is around the systemic racism and how can we counter racism within the sports system. A uh, question came in, what supports would you suggest for provincial sport organizations and NSOs, national sport organizations to counter systemic racism? Um, another one, you know, it's, I'm gonna open with you, Juanique. This one actually is positioned to you. I mean, we know how um, many of your racism experiences on a personal level have been public. I mean, they've been, they've been stories shared publicly in the news about um, your experiences. Uh, so the question, we'll, we'll open with you, Juanique, and then turn to other panelists to talk about countering racism. Throughout your career as an athlete, how did systemic racism affect your ability to access appropriate health care and recover from injuries in sport? Do you have recommendations for NSOs or games medical teams to improve on this, the aspect of sport? Juanique, we open with you. Um. I guess what I would say to that is, uh, and thank you so much for that question. I saw that and I didn't know how to answer it because I'm on my phone. <laughs> but um, it, you know, when it accessing, you know, one of physical, it was never a problem for me to access some sort of physiotherapy or anything like that. Um, but what I found that was the most important thing I was never able to to have support with was the um, the mental injury, the mental stuff. Um, in which not just myself, but uh, many of my teammates suffered from for years and years and years. And um, nobody could understand 
they didn't understand me. They didn't, um, didn't want to understand. It was like, well, we're done, go away. And that was that. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a symptom of a larger problem within sport and the NSOs in this country is we don't value our athletes past their performance. We, and we don't understand just the incredible um, impact that uh, the stress um, that they go through. And uh, if you don't achieve what is expected of you, just how you're seen as a failure, how you see yourself as a failure. And not only to, um, as an indigenous athlete, I didn't only feel that way, like I got put on covers of magazines. I was seen as the face of the failure of my sport at the Olympics. And that's what I got. And I had no support afterwards. Um, but I was, I was lucky. I was really, really lucky because I had a community. Uh, the native community didn't care. They're like, you know, they still tell everybody when every intro, oh, Olympic gold medalist, Winnie Cornwell. And I'm like, I'm not an Olympic gold medalist. <laughs> and it's the first thing I say, but they're like, to us, you are, we don't care. And I'm like, it matters. But I think that it's a symptom of that we don't value the person as a whole. And that's an indigenous value. We understand our people when we look at the body, the mind, the spirit. Uh, the physical attributes of an athlete are such a small part of ourselves. We need to take care of everything. And we need, to, um, we need to look at that athlete, not just what like a racehorse, what they can do for us, but as a whole human being and that no one should walk away from sport feeling damaged or used and suffering for years afterwards. And if I could say that would be a contribution to an indigenous perspective for the entire sports program, that's what we need to fight for. And we need to fight for people to provide that kind of wraparound service. Thank you, Monique. Um, Alec, I'll invite you to go next to speak to how can we, how can uh, the sports system help be an ally, help with countering uh, racism? I guess I, I just make reference to my own personal experience regarding how I recovered from a history that I often speak about. And, um, and I think sh learning to share um, I guess common experiences uh, between nations and uh, individuals, people, uh, by telling people who you are, where you come from, and, uh, and I'm experiencing that right now. I, I, I'm playing soccer with 16 over guys and the 17 over guys, and there again, I get fascinated by the questions that they ask me about uh, who are you, where are you coming from, you know. So it kind of illustrates to me that um, I think we've we've stayed together, we bonded together because we have the opportunity and um, uh, the strength to ask those type of questions. So they now understand. Oh, I can now understand why Alec is the way Alec is, you know. And um, so I just say that from a systems point of view, uh, we, we got to take that step forward and be bold enough to uh, treat it. Uh, humanizing in a humanizing way to say, let's ask the question. Uh, as simple as it sounds, that's I guess that's that's been one of my survival tools. So with that, thanks, Lara. Thank you, Alec. Um, we'll go to Rosalind and then end with a lyric um, to just either address the the racism piece um, question that's come in to you specifically. Uh, Rosalind was just asking for some advice on um, speaking about the importance for the involvement of Indigenous voices or peoples or elders in the creation of sport physical activity curriculum. Wondering, the question is, if you have any advice on how to balance involvement versus burdening Indigenous people or elders, similarly to what Lyric described. So there's that question posed to you as well. So just asking for any final comments, anything you would like as takeaways to our audience um, in addition to this question. I think the major thing that we need to um, dismantle racism is to make sure that we have more Indigenous people in sport coach positions, leadership positions, faculty positions that are in a place where they can co-create together with people, whether they're just not um, for our programming. And I think that starts at the youth, um, like creating, um, promoting youth at a very young age uh, from high school to be in leadership positions, um, to offer sports and recreation after school, to be leaders in that way, and that um, they are brought up in a way that they know the value and importance of being physically active and 
going back to the ideas of holistic health and wellness, I really don't believe you could have spiritual health and wellness unless you are physically active. You know, that's just something that's really important. And, and that could be of any type of matter, whether it's riding a horse through the trails or running a marathon. And I think being physically active brings you stronger ties to your spirituality and your ties to the seven past generations. And there was a comment I do want to address in the questions and answers, but healing, what, what I meant from that is that we, we need to approach people that we don't have the expectation that they have to heal to be in a relationship with you. And I think that one of the best things I did ever with my father was unconditional love that I accept him for who he was. And from there, he, he, he could heal. So that to me is the first step for healing is to have an unconditional love and acceptance. Thank you, Kuksha. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mouse. Yeah, physical literacy about, you know, those fundamental movement skills and the confidence, you know, that that we as people need in order to be to be, um, you know, active for life. Um, it's also about survival, like we need those skills to be able to to move quickly to to harvest berries to, on that walk in the trail to lift the fishing nets when we're getting our fish. Um, it's about our people's survival too. So physical literacy is so, so important. And that need for indigenous leaders and coaches and role models. Lyric, you spoke to that. I mean, you had Brad Baker there as a role model and leader for you. Uh, gosh, I sure hope Brad's with us today. So I'd love for him to um, be here to, to hear that. Um, just would like to offer you any, any closing remarks that you would like to leave our audience with on and any of the topics we've covered today. Um, just to kind of touch on what Wani talked about, about um, just when like organizations and coaches look at you as just what you can do on the field. It's definitely something I've struggled with is like, okay, well, are, can you just get out there and do what I need you to do? Um, and I'm actually injured right now. And as much as it sucks, it's also given me the opportunity to realize that I am a lot more than what I just do on the field or what I do at practice. And it's also given me an opportunity to um, speak about things that I've been quiet about because I was scared, but now, I mean, I'm just gonna go for it and speak. Um, so like even being on this panel is super cool and um, super grateful for the opportunity and just, um, you know, it's helped me realize also that I'm more than my performance or uh, what I can do. Um, so yeah, I'm really grateful for that. Thank you, Lyric. Yeah, we all know that sport is medicine, right? Sport is preventative medicine, it is good medicine. And one of the beauties about it is that it is such easy medicine to swallow because it is fun, um, it's, it feels good. Uh, so the more that we can create those inclusive and welcoming spaces for indigenous children and youth and, and people to participate, the closer we can be on advancing reconciliation uh, when it comes to, to sport and physical activity. One of the most profound responses that um, iSpark received in doing engagement around the province of BC, asking Indigenous communities and leaders uh, the question, what is reconciliation in the context of sport look like? Like when we're talking about sport and physical activity and health, what does reconciliation look like? And one of the most profound responses that I heard was a gentleman saying, I think we know we're getting closer when the health outcomes of our people are on par with the average Canadian. So we know the importance of decolonizing those spaces, sport and physical activity in order to help us advance on that pathway and that journey. Reconciliation is a process, it's complex and it's, it's a living and breathing thing. And I appreciate all of you today to offer your perspectives, your stories, your journeys, um, and your wisdom when it comes to decolonizing sport and physical activity. So this has been some amazing dialogue, some awesome insights. Again, I'm super humbled to be, to be with you on this amazing panel today. Um, and thank you to those who managed to stick around for the, the, this extra little five to 10 minutes here. I'd like to just send it back to Cole, our MC, to um, do the acknowledgements. Uh, and, and once again, thank the partners involved with, with being here. And thank you, Lyric, Rosalind, Juanique, Alec. Thank you so much.
Kwasai. Thank you all very much. Um, but yeah, echoing those those comments, I feel like I learned so much uh, as a community uh, youth soccer coach myself. I feel as though I've, you know, if nothing else, it was a great opportunity for me to listen, sit, and reflect on my own coaching practices and how we can all take these small efforts at decolonizing our sport and our communities in, in as I say, in small but measurable ways. Um, so transitioning to the end, uh, wait, we'll look for some slides here from uh, Move UBC as well as UBC Wellbeing. Um, but generally speaking, I wanted to thank all of the partners, uh, School of Kinesiology, Move UBC, UBC Wellbeing, UBC <laughs> Rec, there we go, um, and everyone in between. Uh, this last piece is on uh, where you can find additional ways to get moving at uh, the Indigenous Physical Activity and Cultural Circle. Um, so yeah, it is move, move UBC month. So we're really excited to, to stimulate, uh, activity in any way that we can. So yeah, thanks very much for that. From a learning circle standpoint, uh, this concludes our February programming. We'll have sessions in March that will, uh, that will be focused on summer programming for indigenous youth, what that's going to look like in the, in the pandemic times, or sorry, during, during a pandemic, we'll also have sessions on cultural safety and acute care settings. Um, and then sessions on indigenous research pedagogies and uh, pedagogies and uh, methodologies as well. So we're looking forward to those. Hope that you'll join us. Um, but until next time, uh, everyone take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.